the icon of the American West, a symbol of strength and endurance, the Mustang. It has thrived here for hundreds of years and has become synonymous to freedom and American pride. However, it has not always been that way. 1492, the year Christopher Columbus arrived from Spain to the West Indies. With him, he brought domesticated horses. Soon after, Spanish conquistadors began exploring North America, bringing these horses in their expeditions. Horses were brought from Mexico to Texas in 1542. And soon after, another Spanish expedition came to Texas, led by Alonso de Leon, this time with over 700 horses. From these expeditions came the wild horse we know today, the Mustang. These Mustang populations soon grew rapidly, expanding across North America. Currently, there are over 75,000 wild Mustangs at Rome Free and another 45,000 in holding facilities in the United States. These horses now compete with native wildlife and cattle ranchers for food and water. There's not enough natural predation to keep the numbers in balance. And so we have to do methods to reduce the number of growth or we run into these boom and bust scenarios which are not good for the horses and not good for the range. We also have to think about all the other animals that depend on the habitat. We manage the habitat for the wildlife species and there's everything from deer, elk, to sage grouse, gunnison sage grouse, all of these different species that depend on the same habitat. While they may not eat the same things, habitat destruction through overgrazing can have very negative second and third order effects that can damage the range to irreparable levels. This measurement determines how many animals can exist without damaging the rangeland ecosystem. In some areas where the horses aren't managed, the damaged ecosystem affects the horses themselves. Food and fresh water become scarce and the horses suffer. On Cumberland Island off the coast of Georgia, horses were released into the wild to fend for themselves. Due to the lack of management, the population of these horses has surpassed what the ecosystem can provide and in turn, they suffer. Across America, there are certain environments that can support the ever-expanding horse populations, while places like Cumberland Island cannot. This leads to a national controversy of removal. Horses have been seen to have deep emotional connections to those around them, with humans and their species alike. So removal can prove to be quite stressful. There's this sweet little oh, red, well, she was a sorrel mare named Matawa, which means dear one. Every time we ever had a roundup, Matawa's babies got taken off, which was hard. And everyone but one. And she comes into the trap with her stallion, Silver, as usual, and here she is with her baby. And uh, they're, they're in the trap all day, milling around. And at the end of the day, they said, of course, Silver and Matawa get to go because they're older, but we will keep her baby because this baby's very adoptable. Well, all the horses run, go flying out of the trap, the ones that get released, except for Matawa. She left, but she didn't leave the area. She, she um, paced on the outside of the pen and her little foal paced with her. And my friend that was with me said, <clears throat> When they put that little one in the horse trailer, Matawa's going to drive that horse trailer out here. That, that mare's going to follow that trailer. I bet she is. She's going to go to the cattle guard. And I said, do you think so? And she said, I do. And I said, I can't watch this then. I'm going to go to Monument Rock and help set up the trap for tomorrow. She gets to Monument Rock about an hour later. She's crying. <laughs> and she said, she did it, Marty. 
she she chased that trailer all the way to the cattle car with you. And it's like, yeah, and they don't have feelings. And we do this to them. You know, it's just, it's sinful. It's just, it's, it's criminal. This raises the question, how do we manage these icons of the American West? Some argue that the most economical way of managing these populations is euthanasia. However, the term euthanasia is used loosely, as many of these horses are brought to slaughterhouses and killed for products such as pet food. A very important part of this champion's diet is meat. That's why we feed him friskies. The principal ingredient is lean red horse meat, the best you can buy. The U.S. stopped slaughtering horses for human consumption 10 years ago, and less horses are being shipped to Canada and Mexico for slaughter as ever before. The last three slaughterhouses were closed in 2007. Slaughtering horses is illegal in the U.S., and the BLM handled this by changing the way they sold horses. They now sell horses using adoption requirements. However, some buyers use a loophole in the requirements to purchase horses for shipment. Since then, the BLM changed the sale policy to limit sales to four horses within a six-month period, pertaining to the adoption requirements to help keep kill buyers at bay. The Trump administration's 2018 budget included a proposal that completely changes these policies putting new ones in place that open the door for horses to be sold for slaughter. Horses cannot be slaughtered in a humane way. They have instincts to run, and their long necks make it difficult to bring a bolt gun to their heads for a quick death. This means they're not always killed on the first try. These horses die confused and terrified. Fortunately, there are many people and organizations working to stop the slaughter through other solutions. In Grand Junction, Colorado, the local Bureau of Land Management is working together alongside an organization called Friends of the Mustangs to manage horses in new economical ways that help the rangelands and the horses. The USGS got together with the Bureau of Land Management and decided they wanted to do a fertility control study using porcine zona pellucida, which is PZP. It's a natural material created from pig ovaries. And what it does is it, when it's injected into the horse, keeps the horse from getting pregnant for one year. We started our program in 2002 as part of a research program and that research went from 2002 to 2004. It was doing so well for us that we've continued on since then. And basically what it's amounted to is that we were having 30 to 40 foals per year, and we've reduced that down to 10 to 20, so we basically have cut that in half. And what that means is that we've reduced our population growth in half. The first step is to identify the mares that we're gonna dart. We don't dart every mare. We want some mares to foal and contribute genetically to the herd. Once that happens, then I as, I, as a darter, are going to mix up the vaccine, the PZP and the adjuvant. Once that's mixed, then we inject with another needle that vaccine into this dart. So I would load the dart. This is a special gun made for darting. This particular gun uses a, a 22 blank charge. So that's in the mirror standing down there, 50 yards. I'm gonna set up and get my crosshairs on her iron quarters and I'm gonna pull the trigger. I'd like to say, let's keep working on finding ways to control the population so we won't have to have gathers or roundups and let every horse that's born on the range live there and die there. 
Some argue that Mustangs do not need humans to manage them. But here in Grand Junction, the Bureau of Land Management helps care for these horses, even though they are wild. The BLM will often go out and clear the brush to create pastures for them to graze and set up water stations so the horses have access to fresh water during the winter and dry seasons. Treated mares can live five to 10 years longer than untreated mares due to the absence of stresses from pregnancy. It was proposed to use the contraceptive on Cumberland, but federal funding was withdrawn as some island residents complained. The Little Book Cliffs Wild Horse Range of Grand Junction proves that with just a little help, horses can live wild, healthy, and free. However, PZP is not the only solution. It's September in Fort Worth, Texas. The air is hot and dry. Many of America's finest horse trainers from around the country proudly gather to show their horses. But these are not your regular domestic horses. These are Mustangs. One hundred days ago, these horses were brought from the wild. Trainers chose them and worked with them throughout the year. And today is the day where we see the results. Mustang Makeover is a competition where trainers from across the country get a hundred days to test their skills and take a horse from totally wild and knows nothing to becoming a really awesome partner and being able to be ridden under saddle and become something that's adoptable for the public. These horses go up for adoption and are prized due to their strong genetics. Having wild genes makes these horses stronger and healthier. The next group of Mustangs are brought in from around the country, wild as can be, to be chosen and trained for the next round of adoptions. So the difference between a domestic horse and a Mustang is these guys have had to fend on their own and they do have predators out in the wild and they have never really been around humans in the close proximity. So they're pretty strong and once we can get them to trust us, you can go leaps and bounds and do whatever you want. They just basically turn into a domestic horse. So that's the difference, getting the trust and respect of a Mustang. A lot of people think that a wild Mustang can never be domesticated realistically. It is no different than a horse. He's just been, he was born in the wild, raised in the wild. He has to learn to run from predators. He's got to learn to see when there's danger. He needs to learn to fend for water. He, he doesn't, uh, he's not spoiled to the point where he gets to have everything catered to him like a domestic horse. Domestic horses, from the time they're hit, they hit the ground, we feed them, we grain them, we pet them. We are like, we just smother them. So we spoil them in a sense. We have a serious problem with too many horses in America. These horses deserve homes. They need homes. They're very worthy animals, and they need to be given a chance. So it is a, it's an honor to work with them and work with the program to try to get America to understand their horse. As American taxpayers, we own these animals. We are paying for the care of these animals. These animals are worthy of a chance to get out of holding and, and be in a private home where people can really enjoy the... These are majestic animals. These are symbols of America, and we need to take care of them. And it's a big responsibility, and we need to be much more active in helping these horses. These people, along with many others, have proved that slaughter is unnecessary. Mustangs can be managed with fertility control, and through events like the Extreme Mustang Makeover, become great companions.
what will become the fate of the Mustang. The Mustang is a symbol of the American West in all of its natural and awe-inspiring glory. Killing these beautiful creatures will leave a deep red stain on the hands of America for generations to come. We need to be a voice for the voiceless and stop this slaughter. Man is not the only animal that wants to live in freedom and peace. <laughs>